Hey, hey, Blue Table fans! Yeah! All right. I'm, I'm, listen, the shockwave of happiness is not gone forever. All right. So first off, the smoke from the California fires has finally made its way to Utah. And combined with other factors, I'm clearing my throat a lot. So excuse me in advance for that. Mm-hmm. All right, guys. First off, I don't have a list. <clears throat> I have no idea what I'm going to talk about. Uh, uh, in other news, uh, there's been this year. There's been some major events for Warhammer 40K in Utah, and I went. I went to the first two. The third one, I really regret not going to it. Uh, it's. It turned out to be like this really amazing event in this really cool venue. And uh, one challenge to holding an event is obviously getting a venue which costs money. <clears throat> and that's really the primary thing. My fantasy is just to have the studio be large enough to just hold these things in it just because I, you know, just because I feel like it. But. Here we are. Uh, so that event uh, went really well, and I've been keeping my uh, finger on the pulse of what's called the meta, like who's winning games, like what army should you bring based on sort of how the rule set is evolving and stuff like that. And for a while there, a couple of years ago, I thought that Games Workshop was actually balancing the game. I was like, yes, they've got up-to-date points, so instead of like every four year, you had to wait four years for your codex to be updated, and that was the only time your points would change. Now they change at least once a year. Everybody gets points alterations. I think that they are tweaking it nicely, it's so it's, and it's vastly improved over what it used to be, but the rules churn of the rules always changing and different armies going up and down, that actually sells models. And this is something when I had my game store in Oregon in the late 90s, I noticed that whoever lost the game, they would go to the wall and try and figure out what they needed to get in order to improve their army. Yeah, the lighting is kind of weird in here. I've tried to balance it, but oh well, this is what it is. Wait, can I get it better? Oh, that's, that's where the light's coming from. Oh, that's nice. All right, I think that works better, right, guys? All right, anyway, uh, by the way, you may hear family sounds in the background. Uh, so I have my Necrons army, which I absolutely adore. I've taken a little break from them. Uh, you'll hear why in a minute. And I set a goal to play 100 games this year. I'm now down to 40. <laughs> 40 games is my goal. I played 20, and I think I can get the other ones in before the end of the year. And uh, what I've noticed is the Necrons are breaking into the top tables. And with army lists that are just like this and that, things I didn't think were that good, apparently they're good. In a recent event in Orlando, Canoptic Wraiths, which are those windy sort of uh, insectoid, cobra looking things, cockroach looking things too, uh, they, they made an appearance there too. And I really, th I'm going to do a video where I have my Necron army out, <clears throat> and I painted a ton for it, by the way. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the various units and what they do and stuff. And, and what I noticed going to more competitive events, nothing wrong with it, is that uh, it's the secondaries. The game of 40K has changed. I love 9th edition. So your games are points. You can get zero points you can get 100 points. And you get 45 from taking objectives, you can get up to 45 from secondary objectives, and then you get 10 for painted. So obviously I got the 10 for painted. My, my primary objectives of actually taking objectives on the board, like controlling certain spots, I do very well with that. Necrons are really strong in that area. And possibly, like going back in time, I bet when they were making that book, they were like, uh, they were like, oh, maybe we made it too powerful. 
And quite frankly, I think it is really an excellent book. I don't, I don't see a problem with it. So anyway, says the guy that's gone two and 18, I've lost so many, like I lose every game. It's, pre it's pretty bad. Uh, even newer players are like, yay, I won one. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Uh, well, and for me, that, that's a change because my whole life I've played informally, didn't care about it. I really just cared if my opponent had a good time. And I still care about those things. Uh, but I do want to play my army better, know my army, become practiced, and that's, that's a dedication of time. So anyway, the Necrons are getting into the top tables, and um, it's the secondary objectives. That's where I tank, because I usually go to sleep on those. Like, I'm not paying very much attention. I'm like, oh, maybe I'll get them. At the end, I'll find out if I did anything with those. Well, that's not how you can have to play. You've got to pay attention to those secondary objectives and be doing them. And it makes it so that it's not just about shooting and fighting and killing things. You know, your opponent could be speeding around and just picking up those points from secondaries while you're not paying attention. I think that's where a lot of players, including myself, fall flat on their face. All right, that's my blurb about Warhammer 40K. Uh, yeah, this local, this recent local tournament was turned into a major event. The venue was insane. So, oops, I missed it, but that's okay. There will be other things in the future. The world is returning to normalcy, which is amazing. Uh, I've got a lot to say about that, but I keep my mouth shut because uh, the more I, oftentimes on a variety of issues, I think it through in my head and I'm just like, oh, well, I really, I, I don't think I have anything to contribute. And that's what it is. Social media is a lot of people running around with opinions, trying to like, I guess, persuade everybody else, but nobody's really listening. Uh, and I'm like, oh, well, I guess every, everyone thinks they're right. And I'm, I look at myself and I'm like, well, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm not as reliable. Maybe I'm not reliable enough to be spouting opinions about things. So, <clears throat> uh, just uh, keeping it simple. All right. Uh, in other news, we got uh, Google Fiber at our house, and that's really awesome. It makes me happy. When I say our, I mean my new wife and I. And new means two years. We uh, had our second anniversary relatively recently, and that's really awesome. We live in, we live in peace. It's really great. And really, I think this is one of the greatest times to be alive. And I'm really excited to see what happens next. I really think the up and coming generation, and there always is, is, is gonna do some amazing things. We're gonna see some really outstanding technologies come up and, that are gonna change things. And I think that recent technologies like the internet, uh, they're not done changing how humans do things. Just having a phone, a cell phone, it's like this crazy cyborg technology. Oh my gosh. It's, 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 it's just blowing my mind. I mean, I grew up in an era where if you needed information, you would go to the library. They would have encyclopedias. And you would get... And I, by the way, when I was in fifth grade, I would read the encyclopedias. Just read them like a book. Because I love reading now we have Wikipedia, and I gotta tell you, I spend an inordinate amount of time on Wikipedia because I'm curious about things. I hear so about something or someone, and I'm like, oh, what's their deal? Read, 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 read. And so it's definitely changed me as a person. Hold on, hold on a second, guys. I gotta get my speaker charging. I bought, I bought this cheap speaker, and it's, it's, like it's it's pretty bad. It can be at a full charge, and then at night, and then you unplug it from being charged because it starts making a noise, right? And by morning, it just drains out from no activity. <laughs> it's so bad, so bad. Uh, well, that's that's what you get for picking the cheapest option. All right. So, uh, what else is going on? So right now I live with my 19-year-old son, which is wonderful. It's uh, a time where I can get to know him. Um, he is uh, turning 20 soon. So that's crazy. 
That's all I have, a 20-year-old and then a 22-year-old daughter. And uh, it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, it's, I meet a lot of young people in my line of work, and I would say it's okay to not have kids. I don't regret having mine. They're fantastic. But uh, yeah, a lot, I think a lot of people feel like this obligation to do it. Uh, and just from kind of co coasting through life or like so, uh, sociality has sort of these rails that you're on, you know, do this, go to college, get married, I don't know. And it's like, yeah, my advice to young people, you don't got to do that stuff. It's, it's okay to live your life for yourself, invent something different that you want to do, that you're really interested in, and kids are awesome, no kids also awesome. And, but you can't have both. That's the weird thing about life. Like, you, picking something sometimes shuts down these other options. And uh, that's great. I, I've been thinking recently, wouldn't it be great if, like, uh, I guess in the next life, you could go back into this life and just sort of see how things would have played out differently if you'd done different things. I'm not talking about the kids thing now. I'm just talking about, um, like, knowing, knowing what I know now, what would it be like to go back to be 12, 15, 23, and so forth. Uh, and then there, when I sort of play that through my mind, not in terms of regrets, like, my life has been awesome. Like, the feeling I have is accomplishment. And, because guys, I did stuff. And most people don't even know. It's like, who is this guy? <laughs> well, I'm a guy who did some stuff. And, it'd be interesting to go back and do things differently. But then I think, well, here you are now. You only have the present moment. That's it. The present moment is real. Everything else, you can't go back and have and have a memory be as clear as what's happening right now. Uh, you can relive emotions, I think, to the full extent. Maybe even exaggerated. And that's a different thing to think about. But anyway, but I'm here now. Am I doing things now the way that my future self might advise me to do them? And I think so. I'm enjoying life. I found my inner peace. I'm getting better and better, better and better at uh, not becoming frustrated with the little things. And hey, baby, do you want to come in? I'm making a video. Do you want to come on it and, sh and say hello? No. You don't want to say hello to the Blue Table Painting fans? No, she says, no thanks. Hey, what have you done with my daughter? No. You person that doesn't want attention? <laughs> Okay, well, anyway, uh, <clears throat> I, by the way, my five-year-old daughter had me set up the tripod and the camera, and she got models and started talking about them, because she sees me do it. And uh, Audrey, my five-year-old, she, she's in an unusual position. She's the only child of myself and Luli, and she's also the youngest of five of all the kids that I have had. And uh, so she's, she's sort of figuring that out. She's like, oh, I have brothers and sisters? Like, and she's at that age where you become conscious, three, four, five. That's a point where you start remembering, like infantile amnesia is no longer, and you actually start remembering things. So what else is going on? Uh, Valhalla in the fall. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Valhalla is an idea that I started implementing in 2010, 2011 actually, <clears throat> and uh, originally we'd go to Sundance and it's, it's basically like a miniature, uh, like a small little convention that's high end. Uh, personal chef for the whole thing, an amazing venue, and uh, deluxe tables and terrain set up. And then we get some names in, uh, like local, like internet celebrities in the wargaming community to come out 
and at first we did it at Sundance. We had Mini War Gaming out. This is when they were small, and we were kind of at the same level, and um, yeah, those guys would those guys would come out, and we had uh, different people from different companies come out, and that was a, a like a draw, and they would have everything uh, comped, so everything sort of balanced out, so that they would be based well. Uh, like an influencer, I guess. So anyway, uh, long about 2015, I didn't really feel like doing it anymore, and I passed it off to Miranda, aka Wargamer Girl, and she's really made it her own and uh, made it successful. And now it has its own impetus. The tickets are, uh, as far as I can tell, they're auto sold out just every year, and about 50 or 60 people come. Last year, because of the nonsense. Uh, that was a year where it was a little lower. I think like 30 some odd people came out to it. So uh, but this year uh, it surged back up. I think people are hungry for life now and uh, we're going to... Oh, so I'm brought out as, uh, as, a, as a courtesy for getting the whole thing going. Uh, Miranda graciously has me out every year to enjoy it, but not have to worry about it. Yes, thank you, thank you very much. I'll I'll say yes to that. And uh, so the last couple of years, I've done Dungeons and Dragons at Valhalla. I run a D and D game with miniatures and terrain. It's all very swanky. And, which is, of course is my dream. Given my druthers, I would just make terrain and paint models and run, I'm gonna say, two to three in-person role-playing games every week. Uh, yeah, and that's, that's probably the maximum. Even in the scenario where I simply have resources and lots and lots of them, I just have other people make the terrain and figures and I'm running two or three games a week. And uh, effectively, being creative becomes the thing. And if you look on my web store, link in the liner notes, you can actually, for a princely sum, have me set up this complete elaborate thing for you and your group out at Sundance at this place that is insane. Yeah, a side effect of doing Valhalla all those years that I've scouted up and down Sundance uh, and up and down the state of Utah, uh, actually. So, <clears throat> so in Sundance, there's this place, I can't remember the name of it, but it's like Sundance goes up these two little ravines, and then at the top, there's a place that's like pretty much at the top. And it is like, it's like a mini little ski resort, but it overlooks this valley. It, it, and it's, it's like Rivendell. It's crazy. There's this huge waterfall across the way that comes down. And, and in the summer and the spring, oh, I bet even in the winter, it's just so crazy, beautiful. It is a resort. So my fantasy is to have a group come out just buy the thing. That'll give me the funds I need. Don't worry about a thing. I can get it all set up. And pretty much the entire amount is dumped back into the actual event. So I would do a custom, uh, like a custom adventure with miniatures and everything. And then, of course, the private chef, that whole thing. Uh, Valhalla originally was going to be something that we were going to run every month to two months. And the first year we tried to do, I think, four to six of them, but it just, it just didn't have the impetus to do it. And uh, to, to really do it that way, and that's my big dream, is permanent Valhalla. And to do that, you would need between 120 and 150 coming out automatically every, every year. And uh, depending on the location, because the place at Valhalla, Valhalla in the fall, which is Wargamer Girls thing, uh, that venue can accommodate 50 or 60 people. They can't all sleep there. That was something we ran up against was like, we would 
the more we grew it, then you'd need a bigger venue, but then your expenses would go up too. So it's hard to like escape the bubble. And so, so what happens is they rent auxiliary cabins and people just do that on their own. They find them, they have five guys that come out, they all stay at the same place. And then year after year, it just becomes sort of a habit and a thing that they go to. And <clears throat> of course, I would love, that was originally sort of the fantasy that I was in love with is to have a permanent Valhalla and then just have people out and then have people out because they're interesting. That'd be awesome. And get rid of uh, some of the cost associated with it. And uh, so that's that. But of course, that would be a different life to live at a place and be a permanent host. And of course, I've always said my uh, secret inner role in life is Elrond, to be a host. And in a way, in recent years, I've gone away from that, become more reclusive. And I have people, they ask, oh, Sean, why don't you go out? Why aren't you doing great things? I'm like, because great things can, great things are great, but they can also be a pain. And that's, and I think everybody in their life, they need those times of just like, ugh, let's just, let's, let's take a break from that. <clears throat> and, uh, so with, in terms of my life and blue table painting, which of course is my profession, uh, it's, I'm, I'm building something, I'm building something different, building something a little more private, a little more uh, family centric, and it's, and it feels really, really good. Uh, in other news, I just want to just tell you some, a couple of personal things, uh, I'm watching uh, cooking shows and I love those, like shows where some guy travels around and he eats at different places. Those are great, I love, but they make me like so hungry. And I look at these things and even though I'm an amateur, I'm like, I could probably cook most of that stuff. And, but of course that's like, it's a giant mess. And what I found, like yeah, let's talk about cooking. What I found is that I have to cook something 10 times before I get good at it and I make it my own. I come up with my own recipes. I've been subsisting on burritos, and I gotta tell you, and I make them myself, they're awesome. They're like, the ones I make are like, I'm just like, mmm, so delicious. And um, also, every year I try and improve myself in some way, learn a new skill. This year is lawn care. And I undertook, our backyard for several years was just this barren, flat, lifeless thing. Uh, my uh, lovely Luli, she, she really takes care of the yard. And that's something we discussed before getting married. I'm like, I don't like yard work, really don't want to do it. You gotta understand that I contribute in so many other ways that I'm good at, uh, that maybe your typical guy isn't good at those things. I'm great at those things. But lawn care is not one of them. And she loves it. So that works, that works out. She loves getting out there and taking care of everything. But what she basically made, she fertilized it. She made sure all the weeds were pulled. She did all the prep work. And then, I don't know, one day I just looked at it and I'm like, hmm, I'm gonna try something different. So I got online, I found out how to do it. I got a, a hand tiller, like, uh, twist. And I hand tilled the whole backyard and did all the, raking and seeding and uh, did it in this, and what was odd is it didn't come up uniform even though the seed went in uniformly it just came up in like patches I'm like how come it's only 60% coverage why are there these bald spots like they're getting watered they had the same opportunity as everything so I just basically I just kept working at those bald spots right now we're letting it because it's really hot in Utah hot in most places I guess and uh, da 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 Sorry, I was looking at how long the video was going. So, uh, so yeah, I got the lawn, and apparently it takes two years, maybe three years, to really make a lawn come in. And that's what I'm doing now. I'm getting all the existing foliage, which is about 80% coverage. I'm getting that to like get those roots in there, those roots, and get it really to establish itself. Then we can cut it. 
I've let it grow like really, it's like a foot high. It's crazy. But it's growing straight up, and uh, that shade prevents uh, water evaporation too. So anyway, uh, that's kind of my news. Uh, one thing I want to learn about is cryptocurrency. That's my next project. Uh, my goal is to understand how it works and to uh, purchase, make some purchase, own some and make some purchases with it and understand how it works. Because I think that's coming up. Uh, I, yeah, obviously a wave of inflation is coming. And you guys know that for a long time been interested in economics, monetary policy, something, some things like that. And, uh, but I don't like to talk about it anymore. Read the opinion thing I was talking about earlier. And, uh, yeah, and that, and I just like, Sean, you got to live your life. Why? Don't get worked up over all this stuff and make your present the only time I have to enjoy miserable and get distracted. It's almost like things kind of get into my eyes and I can't see what's like around me. You know, my, uh, my lovely wife is often like, Sean, wake up. We're, you know, we're here. We're having a good time. Why? Don't be concerned about these things that aren't happening. And I'm like, yep, you're right. And that's how I've been changing my life to start enjoying the present and uh, concentrating on things that matter. That has been really amazing because uh, all that worry didn't, didn't really change anything. It just, what am I, what am I doing tonight? That, that'd be awesome. And uh, I, you know, I go on Facebook and all these young people have some pretty strident opinions about things. And I'm like, okay, awesome, awesome. here, you, you do it. <laughs> you, um, you make the world a better place. Good for you. I'm all for it. Fantastic. I'm going to, I'll be, I'll be in the back tending the lawn. So anyway, uh, that's what I got going on. Oh, uh, I didn't finish my thought with Valhalla. Uh, I do Dungeons and Dragons at Valhalla, doing it again this year. I'm very excited for it. I think in another video I talked about different possibilities. I'm pretty much going with the Badlands thing now. I've started painting miniatures for it. You'll see a video about that. Um, and uh, I, I was embarrassed to make that video because the faces on my models, I didn't put much effort into them. And, uh, you know, still, after all these years, I'm still working on doing good faces. It's, it's tough. It's tough to paint a face the size of a pinhead. Just crazy. All right, well, uh, coming up on a half hour for this video. Hmm. And I think uh, it's about time I watered the lawn. What time is it even? Let me just check. Just for the sake of us here. Yeah, 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock mountain time. All right, guys. Uh, thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. Um, it's probably late for this, but here's the plug. We're open. We're still around. We're open for business. Right now, I have artists that are ready to get going right away for lower level projects, like level two, three, maybe four, and uh, other projects can still be done in the normal time frame, which is tightening up. And that's, that's been a really bit, uh, a bit of good news this year, is the turnaround time is getting back to mm, amazing, much better. So, uh, I think that's, I think that's it. Thanks for tuning in. I really, Really appreciate it.